Uh, let me congratulate uh, and thank Carrie Kennedy and the Kennedy, Robert Kennedy Foundation for this gift of this exhibit from another time that speaks to us in timeless ways. Uh, the brief remarks that I had prepared tonight are focused on John and Robert Kennedy and their struggle for civil rights, uh, the title of this exhibit. Uh, but after having a chance to review the exhibit this evening, I realized that I would be remiss if I did not also acknowledge the role of Martin Luther King, who is prominently featured in the images presented tonight. He was, of course, the giant in the civil rights movement through courage, example, nonviolent protests, civil disobedience, and extraordinarily powerful oratory, no one did more to advance the cause of civil rights than he did. This past March, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to join a bipartisan group, the Faith and Politics Institute, and to go on a three-day pilgrimage in the South. That pilgrimage retraced Martin Luther King's steps from the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement in 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, with the bus boycott undertaken because blacks had to surrender their seats to whites, to the campaign in Burling, Birmingham, Alabama against racial segregation and economic injustice, including a visit to the church bombed by the Ku Klux Klan that killed four innocent little girls, to the bloody Sunday march from Selma to the state capitol, all of these events are captured in this exhibit. To walk in the footsteps of Martin Luther King and bear witness to what he did and what he endured for racial justice was for me an eye-opening and profound experience. And of course, the March on Washington, which we saw clips on tonight, 50 years ago, where he gave his most memorable I Have a Dream speech, considered to be one of the finest speeches in the history of American oratory, a speech that galvanized the nation and put civil rights at the top of the political agenda. He lost his life because of his fight for racial justice, but his contribution and spirit will live forever in the hearts of many of his countrymen and countless people around the world. 50 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, another momentous event occurred in America the assassination of President Kennedy. Few events in my lifetime are etched more deeply in my mind than the untimely and tragic death of President Kennedy and then of his brother. Both occurred when I was a student on November 22, 1963, while walking between classes at college at Notre Dame. A friend ran up to me with a frantic uh, manner, an extreme anxiety look on his face, and blurted out that President Kennedy had been shot. What followed were four days of unrelenting grief as I watched on a small black and white TV in my tiny dorm room the unfolding heartbreak of a stunned nation absorbing the full impact of this incomprehensible incompre act of astonishing consequences. In June in 1968, I was a law student at Berkeley volunteering on Robert Kennedy's hotly contested California primary. I went door to door on election day, passing out get out the vote reminders, one of which I have with me still today, 45 years later. It's a picture of Robert Kennedy with his signature saying, I run for the presidency because I want the United States to stand for hope, for the reconciliation of men, for new policies. I watched with joy and excitement Robert Kennedy's victory speech in Los Angeles late in the night on June 4th. I quickly switched off the TV. I had a big test the next morning that I had to get ready for, convinced that Robert Kennedy now had, may have a good chance of being our next president. To my horror and disbelief, I awakened in the morning to learn that he too had suffered the same fate of his brother. This story of my personal experiences on these two tragic days is not unique, it's not unusual or exceptional because almost all of Americans of my generation and a little bit younger, have similar poignant recollections. When asked, virtually all Americans of that age can tell you where they were and what they were doing when they heard the horrific news. And those collective recollections 
have had a lasting impact on the psyche of America. And thank you again, Carrie, for assembling these indelible images all around us tonight. They provide further reminders of their profound influence on the life of America, indeed the world. Influences that still resonate 50 years later. I am in Italy now because President Obama asked me to serve and because when I was young, President Kennedy and then Robert Kennedy inspired me to service. And it has been with so many in my generation and succeeding ones in my country and others reaching from this ancient capital of the earth to what President Kennedy called the Hudson Villages of half the globe. History records their moments of high achievement. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, despite the bellicose advice pressed upon them, President Kennedy and Robert Kennedy acted with a wisdom and restraint that may have saved the human race from humanity's final war. The summer afterwards, the president negotiated the nuclear test ban treaty, the very first arms control agreement, a shaft of light that cut through the darkness of the Cold War. They were tribunes of social justice and equality. John Kennedy was the first president ever to declare that civil rights were, above all, a moral issue. He fought to reform immigration laws, to tear down old barriers of exclusion and bigotry, and the, that first great reform, pushed forward by his inspiration, was completed in the Senate in 1964 by Robert Kennedy and their brother and my friend, Ted Kennedy, who would so brilliantly carry on their legacy and forge a landmark legacy of his own over the next 45 years. After that unforgettable, unforgivable day in Dallas, Robert Kennedy, one of the best of politicians, became the rarest of leaders in politics, a prophet who spoke for the voiceless and against the unyielding pride of endless war. From places of hunger that shamed America to a South Africa stained by apartheid to the campaign trail in 1968 where he summoned his fellow citizens toward equality and away from violence in Vietnam. He sent forth, as he said earlier, ripples of hope. He and John Kennedy had in their greatness, in them, the greatness to bend history itself. I am certain the world <clears throat> would have been a very different place if they had lived. There's something else that you may remember about them. Uh, not only the hours of challenge and fateful choice, the flashes of joy and laughter, and their smiles that still make us foul, smile. It has been said before that these two brothers, who certainly were not perfect, took the world seriously, but never took themselves too seriously. Robert Kennedy, whose candor and commitment discomforted the comfortable, once said, when I was sick last year, my friends in the Senate sent me a get well card. The vote was 42 to 41. <laughs> and John Kennedy once observed that at the end of his presidency, he would be at an awkward age, too old to begin a new career and too young to retire. Well, it was not to be, <clears throat> but what does endure, what endures is symbolized in this exhibit. Most leaders fade into history. Some, some very few infuse it in an abiding way. John and Robert Kennedy enlarged and enriched America's idea of itself and the world's idea of America. Then and now, we, at our best, have asked more of ourselves because of what they asked of us. Here in Rome in July in 1963, in a speech at the Quirinale, President Kennedy <clears throat> said he was leaving Rome with regret. The only excuse for the brevity of my, of my stay, he said, is the certainty of my return the next time with my wife. Now in this exhibit, he returns to Rome with his brother. We see them as they were, and in our mind's eye, we see the force of who they were, what they stood for, and how they lifted our vision and our ideals. And that force is still with us today, and it will touch and shape the horizons of history yet to come. Thank you.